Chapter One of the Death Disc, read by John Greenman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Disc by Mark Twain, Chapter One. Note. The text for this story is a touching incident mentioned in Carlyle's Letters and Speeches of Oliver Cromwell, M.T. This was in Oliver Cromwell's time. Colonel Mayfair was the youngest officer of his rank in the armies of the Commonwealth, he being but thirty years old. But young as he was, he was a veteran soldier, and tanned and war-worn, for he had begun his military life at seventeen. He had fought in many battles, and had won his high place in the service and in the admiration of men, step by step, by valor in the field. But he was in deep trouble now. A shadow had fallen upon his fortunes. The winter evening was come, and outside were storm and darkness, within a melancholy silence. For the colonel and his young wife had talked their sorrow out had read the evening chapter and prayed the evening prayer, and there was nothing more to do but sit hand in hand and gaze into the fire and think and wait. They would not have to wait long. They knew that, and the wife shuddered at the thought. They had only one child, Abby, seven years old, their idol. She would be coming presently for the good-night kiss, and the colonel spoke now and said, dry away the tears, and let us seem happy for her sake. We must forget, for the time, that which is to happen. I will, I will shut them up in my heart, which is breaking, and we will accept what is appointed for us, and bear it in patience, as knowing that whatsoever he doeth is done in righteousness, and meant in kindness, saying, His will be done." Yes, I can say it with all my mind and soul. I would I could say it with my heart. Oh, if I could, if this dear hand which I press and kiss for the last time— Shh, sweetheart, she is coming. A curly-headed little figure in night-clothes glided in at the door, and ran to the father and was gathered to his breast and fervently kissed once, twice, three times— why, Papa, you mustn't kiss me like that. You rumple my hair. Oh, I am so sorry, so sorry. Do you forgive me, dear? Why, of course, Papa. But are you sorry? Not pretending, but real, right down sorry? Well, you can judge for yourself, Abby. And he covered his face with his hands and made believe to sob. The child was filled with remorse to see this tragic thing which she had caused, and she began to cry herself, and to tug at the hands, and say, "'Oh, don't, Papa, please don't cry. Abby didn't mean it. Abby wouldn't ever do it again. Please, Papa.' Tugging and straining to separate the fingers, she got a fleeting glimpse of an eye behind them, and cried out, "'Why, you naughty Papa, you are not crying at all. You are only fooling. and." Abby is going to Mama now. You don't treat Abby right. She was for climbing down, but her father wound his arms about her and said, No, stay with me, dear. Papa was naughty and confesses it and is sorry. There, let him kiss the tears away, and he begs Abby's forgiveness, and will do anything Abby says he must do for a punishment. They're all kissed away now, and not a curl rumpled, and whatever Abby commands. And so it was made up, and all in a moment the sunshine was back again and burning brightly in the child's face, and she was patting her father's cheeks and naming the penalty. A story! A story! Hark! The elders stopped breathing and listened. Footsteps, faintly caught between the gusts of wind. They came nearer, nearer, louder, louder. Then, passed by and faded away. The elders drew deep breaths of relief, and the papa said, A story, is it? A gay one? No, papa, a dreadful one. Papa wanted to shift to the gay kind, but the child stood by her rights as per agreement. 
she was to have anything she commanded. He was a good Puritan soldier and had passed his word. He saw that he must make it good. She said, Papa, we mustn't always have gay ones. Nurse says people don't always have gay times. Is that true, Papa? She says so. The mamma sighed, and her thoughts drifted to her troubles again. The papa said gently, It is true, dear. Troubles have to come. It is a pity, but it is true. Oh, then tell a story about them, papa, a dreadful one, so that we'll shiver and feel just like it was us. Mamma, you snuggle up close and hold one of Abby's hands, so that if it's too dreadful it'll be easier for us to bear it if we're all snuggled up together, you know. Now you can begin, Papa. Well, once there were three colonels. Oh, goody, I know colonels just as easy. It's because you are one, and I know the clothes. Go on, Papa. And in a battle they had committed a breach of discipline. The large words struck the child's ear pleasantly, and she looked up, full of wonder and interest, and said, is it something good to eat, Papa? The parents almost smiled, and the father answered, No, quite another matter, dear. They exceeded their orders. Is that something? No, it's as uneatable as the other. They were ordered to feign an attack on a strong position in a losing fight, in order to draw the enemy about and give the Commonwealth's forces a chance to retreat. But in their enthusiasm they overstepped their orders for they turned the feint into a fact, and carried the position by storm, and won the day and the battle. The Lord General was very angry at their disobedience, and praised them highly, and ordered them to London to be tried for their lives. Is it the great General Cromwell, Papa? Yes. Oh, I've seen him, Papa, and when he goes by our house so grand on his big horse with the soldiers, he looks so, so, well, I don't know just how, only he looks as if he isn't satisfied, and you can see the people are afraid of him, but I'm not afraid of him, because he didn't look like that at me. Oh, you dear prattler! Well, the colonels came prisoners to London, and were put upon their honor, and allowed to go and see their families for the last. Hark! They listened. Footsteps again, but again they passed by. The mamma leaned her head upon her husband's shoulder to hide her paleness. They arrived this morning. The child's eyes opened wide. Why, Papa, is it a true story? Yes, dear. Oh, how good! Oh, it's ever so much better. Go on, Papa. Why, Mamma! Dear Mamma, are you crying? Never mind me, dear. I was thinking of the of the the poor families. But don't cry, mamma. It it'll all come out right, you'll see. Stories always do. Go on, papa, to where they lived happy ever after. Then she won't cry any more. You'll see, mamma. Go on, papa. First they took them to the tower before they let them go home. Oh, I know the tower. We can see it from here. Go on, papa. I am going on as well as I can in the circumstances. In the tower the military court tried them for an hour, and found them guilty, and condemned them to be shot. Killed, Papa? Yes. Oh, how naughty! Dear Mama, you are crying again. Don't, Mama. It'll soon come to the good place, you'll see. Hurry, Papa, for Mama's sake. You don't go fast enough. I know I don't, but I suppose it is because I stop so much to reflect. But you mustn't do it, Papa. You must go right on. Very well, then. The three colonels. Do you know them, Papa? Yes, dear. Oh, I wish I did. I love colonels. Would they let me kiss them, do you think? The colonel's voice was a little unsteady when he answered. One of them would, my darling. There, uh, kiss me for him. There, Papa, and these two are for the others. I think they would let me kiss them, Papa, for I would say, My Papa is a colonel, too, and brave, and he would do what you did, so it can't be wrong, no matter what those people say, and you needn't be the least bit ashamed. Then they would let me, wouldn't they, Papa? 
God knows they would, child. Mama, oh, Mama, you mustn't. He's soon coming to the happy place. Go on, Papa. Then some were sorry. They all were, that military court, I mean, and they went to the Lord General and said they had done their duty, for it was their duty, you know, and now they begged that two of the colonels might be spared and only the other one shot. One would be sufficient for an example for the army, they thought. But the Lord General was very stern, and rebuked them for as much as, having done their duty and cleared their consciences, they would beguile him to do less and so smirch his soldierly honor. But they answered that they were asking nothing of him that they would not do themselves if they stood in his great place and held in their hands the noble prerogative of mercy. That struck him, and he paused and stood thinking, some of the sternness passing out of his face. Presently he bid them wait, and he retired to his closet to seek counsel of God in prayer. And when he came again he said, They shall cast lots, that shall decide it, and two of them shall live. And did they, Papa, did they? And which one is to die? Ah, oh, that poor man! No, they refused. They wouldn't do it, Papa? No. Why? They said that the one that got the fatal bean would be sentencing himself to death by his own voluntary act, and it would be but suicide, call it by what name you might. They said they were Christians, and the Bible forbade men to take their own lives. They sent back that word, and said they were ready. Let the court's sentence be carried into effect. What does that mean, Papa? They... they will all be shot. Hark! the wind. No. Tramp, tramp, tramp. Rumble-dum-dum, rumble-dum-dum. Open in the Lord General's name. Oh, goody, Papa, it's the soldiers. I love the soldiers. Let me let them in, Papa, let me. She jumped down and scampered to the door and pulled it open, crying joyously, Come in, come in. Here they are, Papa. Grenadiers. I know the grenadiers. The file marched in and straightened up in line at shoulder arms. Its officer saluted, the doomed colonel standing erect and returning the courtesy, the soldier wife standing at his side, white, and with features drawn with inward pain, but giving no other sign of her misery, the child gazing on the show with dancing eyes. One long embrace of father, mother, and child, then the order, to the tower, forward. Then the colonel marched forth from the house with military step and bearing, the file following. Then the door closed. Oh, mamma, didn't it come out beautiful? I told you it would, and they're going to the tower, and he'll see them. He, oh, come to my arms, you poor innocent thing. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of the Death Disc by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Chapter Two. The next morning the stricken mother was not able to leave her bed. Doctors and nurses were watching by her and whispering together now and then. Abby could not be allowed in the room. She was told to run and play. Mamma was very ill. The child, muffled in winter wraps, went out and played in the street a while. Then it struck her as strange, and also wrong, that her papa should be allowed to stay at the tower in ignorance at such a time as this. This must be remedied. She would attend to it in person. An hour later the military court were ushered into the presence of the Lord General. He stood grim and erect, with his knuckles resting upon the table, and indicated that he was ready to listen. The spokesman said, We have urged them to reconsider. We have implored them, but they persist. They will not cast lots. They are willing to die, but not to defile their religion. The protector's face darkened, but he said nothing. He remained a time in thought. Then he said, 
they shall not all die the lots shall be cast for them gratitude shone in the faces of the court send for them place them in that room there stand them side by side with their faces to the wall and their wrists crossed behind them let me have notice when they are there when he was alone he sat down and presently gave this order to an attendant go bring me the first little child that passes by the man was hardly out at the door before he was back again leading abby by the hand her garments lightly powdered with snow she went straight to the head of the state that formidable personage at the mention of whose name the principalities and powers of the earth trembled and climbed up in his lap and said i know you sir you are the lord general i have seen you i have seen you when you went by my house everybody was afraid but i wasn't afraid because you didn't look cross at me you remember don't you i had on my red frock the one with the blue things on it down the front don't you remember that a smile softened the austere lines of the protector's face and he began to struggle diplomatically with his answer why uh, let me see i i was standing right by the house my house you know well you dear little thing i ought to be ashamed but you know the child interrupted reproachfully now you don't remember it why i didn't forget you now i am ashamed but i will never forget you again dear you have my word for it you will forgive me now won't you and be good friends with me always and forever yes indeed i will though i don't know how you came to forget it you must be very forgetful but i am too sometimes i can forgive you without any trouble for i think you mean to be good and do right and i think you are just as kind but you must snuggle me better the way papa does it's cold you shall be snuggled to your heart's content little new friend of mine always to be old friend of mine hereafter isn't it you mind me of my little girl not little any more now but she was dear and sweet and daintily made like you and she had your charm little witch your all-conquering sweet confidence in friend and stranger alike that wins to willing slavery any upon whom its precious compliment falls she used to lie in my arms just as you are doing now and charm the weariness and care out of my heart and give it peace just as you are doing now and we were comrades and equals and playfellows together ages ago it was since that pleasant heaven faded away and vanished and you have brought it back again take a burdened man's blessing for it you tiny creature who are carrying the weight of england while i rest did you love her very 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 much ah you shall judge by this she commanded and i obeyed i think you are lovely will you kiss me thankfully and hold it a privilege too there this one is for you and there this one is for her you made it a request and you could have made it a command for you are representing her and what you command i must obey the child clapped her hands with delight at the idea of this grand promotion then her ear caught an approaching sound the measured tramp of marching men soldiers soldiers lord general abby wants to see them you shall dear but wait a moment i have a commission for you an officer entered and bowed low saying they are come your highness bowed again and retired the head of the nation gave abby three little discs of sealing wax two white and one a ruddy red for this one's mission was to deliver death to the colonel who should get it oh what a lovely red one are they for me no dear they are for others lift the corner of that curtain there which hides an open door 
pass through and you will see three men standing in a row with their backs towards you and their hands behind their backs so each with one hand open like a cup into each of the open hands drop one of those things then come back to me abby disappeared behind the curtain and the protector was alone he said reverently of a surety that good thought came to me in my perplexity from him who is an ever-present help to them that are in doubt and seek his aid he knoweth where the choice should fall and hath sent his sinless messenger to do his will another would err but he cannot err wonderful are his ways and wise blessed be his holy name the small fairy dropped the curtain behind her and stood for a moment conning with alert curiosity the appointments of the chamber of doom and the rigid figures of the soldiery and the prisoners then her face lighted merrily and she said to herself why one of them is papa i know his back he shall have the prettiest one she tripped gaily forward and dropped the discs into the open hands then peeped around under her father's arm and lifted her laughing face and cried out papa papa look what you've got i gave it you he glanced at the fatal gift then sunk to his knees and gathered his innocent little executioner to his breast in an agony of love and pity soldiers officers released prisoners all stood paralyzed for a moment at the vastness of this tragedy then the pitiful scene smote their hearts their eyes filled and they wept unashamed there was deep and reverent silence during some minutes then the officer of the guard moved reluctantly forward and touched his prisoner on the shoulder saying gently it grieves me sir but my duty commands commands what said the child i must take him away i am so sorry take him away where to to uh, god help me to another part of the fortress indeed you can't my mamma is sick and i am going to take him home she released herself and climbed upon her father's back and put her arms around his neck now abby's ready papa come along my poor child i can't i must go with them the child jumped to the ground and looked about her wondering then she ran and stood before the officer and stamped her small foot indignantly and cried out i told you my mamma is sick and you might have listened let him go you must oh poor child would god i could but i indeed i must take him away attention guard fall in shoulder arms abby was gone like a flash of light in a moment she was back dragging the lord protector by the hand at this formidable apparition all present straightened up the officers saluting and the soldiers presenting arms stop them sir my mamma is sick and wants my papa and i told them so but they never even listened to me and are taking him away the lord general stood as one dazed your papa child is he your papa why of course he was always it would i give the pretty red one to any other when i love him so no a shocked expression rose in the protector's face and he said ah god help me through satan's wiles i have done the cruelest thing that ever man did and there is no help no help what can i do abby cried out distressed and impatient why you can make them let him go and she began to sob tell them to do it you told me to command and now the very first time i tell you to do a thing you don't do it a tender light dawned in the rugged old face and the lord general laid his hand upon the small tyrant's head and said god be thanked for the saving accident of that unthinking promise and you inspired by him for reminding me of my forgotten pledge oh incomparable child officer obey her command she speaks by my mouth the prisoner is pardoned 
set him free. End of chapter 2 and end of The Death Disc by Mark Twain